uh, we've it's delayed it by a few minutes just to ensure that everybody can get in. Um, but let me just start right now because in the interest of time and to make sure that the rest of the evening goes on schedule. Um, I think it's, it's well aware for all of us how difficult the world is and what kind of difficult times the world is in right now, despite the rising affluence, uh, despite the increasing use of technology, despite the deeper engagement between various regions of the world, we still see a lot of problems. And these have been rising in the recent times. In every continent that you look at, we find there are, there are serious questions about leadership. We, we find that the distrust between civil society, between business, political leadership, is, is not abating. It's, in fact, increasing. And it's increasing in various different dimensions. So we would, we would like to explore some of the themes on why this is happening and what is the way out of it. Uh, and joining me in the conversation are going to be very experienced political leaders, uh, public figures, and a very uh, leading uh, political observer from the US. And I would say that in this panel, uh, uh, all the important continents are, are uh, represented. Uh, I'll begin by uh, inviting uh, former President of Sierra Leone, uh, President uh, Ernest Baikoroma, to, to share some of his thoughts. Uh, President, in your experience as the head of a state and leading a people, um, how do you ensure that you inspire them to believe in what you want to say? Because it's not easy when there are different challenges pulling you in different directions. Thank you. Um, as president of any country, you go through uh, a democratic process of being elected. Now, in that process, you uh, engage members of your country, if it is a universal suffrage or whatever uh, body that is responsible for your elections, you have to engage them. And in engaging them, you present a kind of uh, a campaign uh, program. In other countries, you call it a manifesto, and others, you just call it a, a campaign program. Of course, uh, for my country, in addition to the campaign program, you also have to use a political party that uh, uh, on whose vehicle you will canvass for elections. So you come into office already with some commitments, either commitment to your campaign program, a commitment to the political parties' values and views that whose vehicle you have used, and also uh, out there you uh, come in at a time when you have to address the needs of the country. Now, because of uh, the global world we now live in, you are not only limited to those demands, you are also uh, exposed to um, international expectations, expectations of your sub-regional bodies, for my purposes, it is ECOWAS, expectations of your continental body, the African Union, and expectations of uh, the unilateral body, uh, multilateral bodies. Uh, you have the United Nations. You also have financial multilateral agencies, the World Bank, the IMF. Uh, these are all putting a lot of competing demands on you. Again, it depends on the level of development you are in. But my unique situation was that I I came into governance in 2007, uh, just five years when the country uh, ended 11 years of a very devastating war, a civil war. So there are uh, huge demands for the development of the country, getting it back on its feet to uh, develop. So you have all of these uh, you know, descending on you at the same time. Uh, and um, out there, you also have the opposition, you have the civil society, you have uh, religious groups, you, you have other interests, you know, also put in pressure. And generally, the public would want all of their demands to be answered, uh, the, the social services, the economic provisions to be provided like yesterday. So it's a very difficult situation. 
But again, from my experience, with all of the difficulties, I think, we got together as a government and decided on what uh, few things you can do to establish trust, because you cannot answer all the questions, nationally and internationally. So we decided on working on things that will start the development of the country all over. We prioritize our demands because everything was in great demand. But what is it that you will do that will trigger growth, that will engender hope? Uh, because in a situation like this, there, there is no miracle about it. The only thing that you have to do is to ensure that you provide hope to the people and establish trust. There is no trust, then I think... That but how do you do that? Because that, that sounds easy well, to say, but it is, it is, what are the levers you use to establish that trust? Is when you say something, you follow it up with action, and you lead by example. These are the two things. You remain committed to what you have said, and you lead by example. And when people start realizing positive results, it will build their hope, and they will, you know, because it's something that you have to build over the period. Trust is not acquired overnight. You That's have to point. build it. With so let, let me bring in uh, Minister Badal Dauti from North Macedonia. Firstly, I think we should all uh, join in congratulating you for the long-standing need of uh, and demand that uh, the international community recognized North Macedonia. So, you know, I'd like to applaud the fact that uh, North Macedonia is now uh, independent, separate, well-recognized global uh, 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 by the global community, a country by itself, which has been, uh, you know, pending for many years. As, as President uh, Koroma said, building trust is very important, but today if you look at some of the bigger issues of climate change, of protectionism, um, it's difficult to tell people that you have to give up your personal interest for a larger interest. And that's what we are struggling with. In your experience, what do you think is the best way to inspire that trust and to be able to convince people that you are the right leader? Yeah, I would say that the leadership uh, challenge is uh, to stand on the things that you say. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, I want to thanks for the invitation I received from you. And uh, uh, in terms of this question, I would like to give some uh, my viewpoints regarding globalization issues with uh, respect to political, sociological, and uh, uh, <coughs> economical context. Uh, well, politically speaking, globalization is uh, related to the political openness of the country toward uh, other countries. Uh, economically speaking, uh, globalization is related uh, toward you know, uh, being, uh, having more FDI in the country and having good re uh, trade relationships with uh, third parties. And soci sociologically speaking, I would say that globalization level of society is measured by its ability to shine politically and economically on a diverse social system. Uh, so uh, if we combine all of these things, so that uh, I think that the leadership is, is the challenge of leadership to combine all of these three things in uh, the diversity that we, <laughs> we live. Uh, with respect to political context of North Macedonia toward globalization issues, uh, I would like to, you know, uh, point out the fact that we have uh, some success stories. One of the success stories is related to the name dispute that we succeeded to fix out with Greece, and that was a precondition for uh, having, uh, 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 for being able to be member, uh, to, to, to apply for NATO membership. Uh, also, we have uh, two success stories uh, in different, in other regards. Uh, the first success story is uh, fixing out uh, the problem with Bulgaria. And uh, on an internal basis, we uh, managed to adopt a law on the use of the languages. So having regard all of these things, uh, I think that externally, uh, the governmental policies were related to European values. And on internal basis, also the uh, governmental policies were related to European values uh, to respect diversity and unity. This is, uh, this is the point. And uh, the fact that I want to stress out here is uh, that uh, the EU expansion political agenda shall never stop. 
with regard to uh, Balkan countries. Uh, so Balkan countries uh, shall not uh, be uh, uh, at the waiting room with no backward exit. All the pretending countries for EU membership should, shall not be at the backward of, uh, of uh, actually waiting room with, with no backward exit, but they should be considered and their intentions should be considered for, for integration purposes. This, uh, uh, it is, uh, this fact is at uh, the political benefit of the EU by itself. Why? Because I think that the European Union, uh, pol uh, political, European Union as a political structure nowadays is not safe as it used to be in the last 10 years, let's say. That's, we, that's an understatement. Yeah, uh, we, we, <laughs> we face the, you know, the, uh, the threat, uh, the Brexit threatens yes. in the West. We also face the, uh, unfortunately, the uh, Russian territorial expansions, their ambitions. We have immigration policies, and we have the threats of having the cultural expansion coming from the southeast, and that's uh, where the Balkan countries are. And that's why I want to uh, point out the fact that the Balkan, Balkan countries, especially North Macedonia, uh, can be regarded as a political or ideological border between East and West. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so, Minister, I'm going to uh, ask you to pause here and come to uh, Charles David. And since you know he's he's uh, not in the program, I'll I'll make a short introduction because um, you know we have been talking about uh, various um, issues across the world. But Charles Davidson is a publisher of the American Interest. It's it's a very well respected uh, publication which looks and goes deep into what's happening inside the U.S. And uh, as you know, some of the U.S. politics impacts the rest of the world because of its uh, economic engagement. Uh, Charles, it's, it's very interesting that in today's world, as we speak, you, we are sitting in, in Europe, in Western Europe, but the stability that we expected out of US and Europe uh, has disappeared. What we see is that really the emerging markets, Asian markets are far more stable than what's happening in US and of course what's happening in, in, the, in, in Europe. Brexit is a great example. Minister Doughty talked about the other issues. The trade war between U.S. and China has been triggered by U.S. U.S. is also creating a lot of conflict with, with uh, NATO. U Europe itself is, uh, you know, convulsing with its own contradictions uh, thanks to, to, to Brexit. So really, all of us who are from Asia feel that, you know, the Asia or emerging markets like the African continent are the stable parts. How do you see then uh, the, wh what do you see is the reason behind these regions becoming volatile when they used to be the bulwark for the world? Well, <clears throat> well, Pranal, I, I get the sense that you're disappointed in my country, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't elaborate too much on whether I share this view. Uh, but uh, certainly, I mean, if we go back to, say, 2005, when I started the American Interest magazine, uh, one of my partners, Joe Joffe, published the book Uber Power, uh, and the foreign minister of France, Hubert Védrine, or at that point the former foreign minister, also published a book with this notion. So we were still in a post-World War II world where the United States held the reins to a great extent. Uh, and obviously that has uh, changed uh, on many fronts in terms of our, the diminution of our relative economic power and therefore uh, influence and the internal turmoil uh, in the United States. And um, this, is, this hour is supposed to be about political disruption, uh, which is an assumption, so we're, we're assuming the world is in, in disruption, which uh, suggests that we need reform, we need, uh, we need change. Um, certainly, my country isn't showing much signs of leading the way anymore. And I was uh, recently in, uh, in Germany, I, I can't say too much detail about that, but talking to people from all over uh, Europe and, uh, and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, and, uh, and it's a sort of US government-sponsored environment, and the attitude is, what are you doing telling us about good governance? So we've seen a breakdown of that, and I think what's going on in Europe is very much a result of dissolution of things going on in the US, and we, I hope we'll get to this later, but the pressures on the middle class, if we're going to be a democracy and make reforms and deal with this disruption, we're going to have to address the real 
needs of the middle class. Well, why, and what if I can interrupt for. you, Charles, why is leadership in, in US and Europe, why is it failing today? It, it has led the world for several decades fairly successfully, uh, perhaps at the cost of another part of the world, but uh, what is happening today? Is this a cycle that you see? And you know, some of the economic historians say that if you look at what happened in, in 1000 uh, uh, AD, the, the center of gravity of the world, economic gravity of the world was in Asia. And now we're coming back after almost a thousand years and coming back to that. And therefore, it had to happen. But is there a specific reason why leadership in the developed world is failing itself? Yes, I think there's a very simple reason, and that's that we didn't need it for a while. We didn't need leadership because everything was hunky-dory, uh, democ uh, democracy and freedom was expanding all around the world, and everybody was uh, perfectly uh, uh, happy taking politics for granted and getting uh, focusing on their uh, automobiles and homes and material things. Uh, and, uh, and so now we, we're in a situation we have to redevelop it, but we really didn't need great leadership when everything was fine. So when but things you, go... You limit it um, only to the question of a lack of leadership, or um, do you consider the emergence of a new thinking? Uh, people within countries or communities who do not wholly subscribe to the concept of globalization, because, I mean, uh, out of the beliefs and the thinking of people, you have leaders voted into office. Uh, the leader will not catapult himself. No, but it's I think what you're saying, President, the is the, the kind of people who are voting for leadership are those who feel that they did not get the benefits of whatever happened in their country. Yes. That, well, that is uh, what is reflected in reality in the American situation. You have a new thinking, people uh, wanting to subscribe to the view that uh, it is about us. We are giving away a lot more than we are getting. And that is why we let us take care of ourselves in the first instance before looking out. And uh, when you have a leadership that subscribes to that view, then it will change the whole concept of uh, globalization. I believe what we require now, in fact, is to further strengthen globalization because of the kind of the world we live in. Look at what we are experiencing as uh, a result of the climate change. And every continent is being affected. Absolutely. Nowhere is left out. And uh, you also have the extremists coming in all of the countries. If you don't have a leadership that will ensure that we contain the advancement of the extremists within our societies, then you, you, there will be disruption at the leadership. And that is why I think uh, instead of uh, dismantling globalization, it is time for us to look at it again. We have spent all the time developing the Paris Agreement on climate change. It is not the best, but I think that is the best we can uh, deal with for now. So that, uh, that, we uh, have to that, that compact is still not there. Yeah, we, we still have to move on to ensure that we achieve it. But for it to be dismantled, I mean, where will it take us? The alternative is going to lead the world to a disastrous situation, more disastrous situation. And uh, we are not living... Would you, would you agree, Minister Doughty? Uh, I think yes, but, you know, just... Uh, to give some other uh, other points uh, with regard to successful leadership, I just want to give an example of my country, uh, because that's uh, what that's why I'm here uh, to present some success stories of my of my country with regard to globalization globalization issues. Uh, on economic context, we have also a success story. Uh, we have tripled our uh, the presence of foreign direct investments in our country in comparison to the average value of the last 10 years. And we succeeded to double the uh, presence, the, the exports, in comparison to the average value of five years. Uh, this is mainly due to uh, this is mainly due to some good policies that we have uh, adopted and promoted uh, with regard to private sector developments in in, in the country. Uh, Macedonia is a very successful story in this in this context. 
and uh, we have uh, a new law now uh, enacted from April 2018, which uh, by which we make we, ha we we have we actually uh, give equal treatment to to foreign and uh, to foreign investors and domestic investors. 10% uh, of the investment cost is reimbursed at the end of the fiscal year. We have also the industrial zones where uh, during the first 10 years, uh, zero tax rate is applied to foreign investors and domestic investors. 100% tax exemption during those 10 years for both group of, of for the foreign investors. And these uh, rates apply uh, with regard to profit rate tax value-added tax and custom duties and things like that. So this is why we, uh, this is one of the reasons why we have success in uh, tripling the foreign direct investments and doubling the, the, the exports. So this is the, the point that I wanted to, to sure. give as argument here. I think it's, and I'd like to come to you, Charles, and uh, President Koromo also. And, you know, I'd like you to keep your thoughts ready because I'd like to open it up to get your views as well. It's not a good time to be a leader in any part of the world today. <laughs> uh, you know, you have three options as a leader. If you, if you follow what the people say, then you are called populist. If you, if you go for consensus and get everybody together, then you're called a weak leader because, you know, you can't decide. And if you do everything on your own and you decide, then you're called authoritarian. So is, it, is, is there a way out for a leader, President Koroma? I mean, what should a leader do? Because mm. these three options, whatever you do, you get criticized. Yeah, well, um, like I said initially, you come into office with uh, national demands, maybe a political party demands, national demands, and also the global demands. But as a leader, you should always prioritize, and you look at what is in there in terms of uh, the immediate benefits that will influence or affect your people that will ensure that at least you ensure the survival of the state, the survival of your people. But beyond that, you also have to ensure that your medium and long-term gains will all only add on to the benefits. They will not negate whatever short-term gains you have acquired in your development. That is why I think uh, uh, there has to be a continuous engagement at all levels, even as a leader. You have to engage your community uh, in terms of ensuring that you will not always have consensus. But can, you, can, you, can you give us a story about from your experience where you had to work really hard to earn the trust and take a difficult decision? Well, um, in when we had the issue of uh, trying to influence our people in fighting against Ebola, Ebola, it was a very, it was the worst period for us as a nation. But um, <clears throat> we suddenly had the Ebola outbreak, it's killing everybody, and uh, the only way you can cure Ebola is to isolate people. You don't judge anybody, even if it is your relatives. And we have, uh, our society is such that you always embrace, you shake hands, you take care of the, your children, you take care of uh, the elderly, but these are the things you should not do. Restrict the movement of the people. As a leader, when we are convinced that uh, that is what you should do, you must give instructions, you declare the state of emergency, declare, you restrict the movement of the, it was difficult for everybody. And it was unpopular. Well, we, we implemented it, and um, at the end of the day, they started quickly realizing the benefits of it. And when they saw the benefits, as against, you know, the difficulty they have to go through, uh, quick, people quickly accepted and then uh, we, we were able to come over the difficulty of uh, this. Uh, no, I think uh, what you did at you Sierra Leone, I think it deserves an applause because you, you did a great job in, yeah. in ensuring that uh, a virus which, had, which was threatening not just the country and the continent, but yeah. you know, it had impact across the world, uh, was contained very, very efficiently.
So this is just an example of a difficult decision you have to take. And it goes beyond, there was a lot of criticism. Even the, 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 the Western community that we are there to support us criticize and say, oh, you should not restrict the movement of the people. It is now against so the right So this is where you have people. to, you know, take oh, a you stand. You have to take a stand and take a difficult decision and then move on. But, but Charles, here do you feel that most leaders don't want to take a stand anymore or they take a stand only for their core voter group? And as I told you, that it's not good, it's not easy being a leader these days because you are either seen as authoritarian, either you're seen as a weak person or a person who's, you know, not listening to, uh, to, to anybody or just working for a specific vested interest. Mm -hmm. How should a leader behave today? Is there, is there a template for the new age? Well, I think there, there probably is. I mean, Western leaders are not very effective right now. I think we can see that. Um, and I think our dynamic chairman, Frank Jurgen Richter, has hit the nail on the head with his recent piece in Newsweek magazine where he talks about that it is absolutely essential that Western leaders address the plight of the middle class. And I go as far as, as calling it the plight of the middle class and that other, otherwise things aren't going to work. It's a very binary setup that he posits. We either address the middle class's issues or we fall further. Um, and I think that's correct. And I think that Western politicians haven't done that very effective, uh, effectively yet. One of the things in my country, the United States, is that the middle class's wealth has been decimated. And nobody's talking about this. People are talking about incomes. They're not talking about the fact that in the financial crisis, wealth was destroyed. And people are very angry about this. And uh, Donald Trump really has addressed the anger of these people. He's not giving them anything or any solution, but he's actually, he's plugged into that anger. Uh, if we look at France, we see uh, this uh, yellow vest movement in response to uh, Macron's measures, which was completely unanticipated. So Western uh, leaders need to listen to uh, Frank Jurgen and address the, this uh, neglected middle class. And if we're going to remain democracies, we have to address the needs of the majority of the voters in this middle class, who's by far the vast majority but of our voting base. But that's a great point, uh, Charles. I think what but you made. Frank, Frank's point. They, <laughs> do you want to add uh, anything, Frank? OK. <laughs> You know what Macron is doing, he's taking a stand, but he is seen as an authoritarian person because the yellow vests are, are, they feel that he's not listening to them. Donald Trump is listening to his constituents, so he's seen as a populist, and both of them, for doing two opposite things, are both seen as people who are actually making things worse for their own country. So the question is, what should a leader do? Uh, and I think I'd like to now invite some thoughts from, from all of you, uh, if you have some ideas and questions. Uh, for the for the panel over here, uh, there'll be some mics. Uh, if if you'd like to raise your hands and introduce yourself, I'd like to get your thoughts over here. Uh, the gentleman over there, uh, can I get a mic for him, please? <coughs> please do introduce yourself, and if you if you're directing it to a specific panelist, please let me know. Can you hold the mic closer to you? Yes, yes no. thank you. I think your question is, how was he able to convince everybody and take them together? Is that no, your no, question? No. How was he able to make education remain safe and remain stable? Sane. How to remain sane and stable? Sorry, we, I, we can't... Ah, okay. 
So how could you convince that education is the main part and, and the key for development and helping people go to the next level of development? Well, I think it goes without saying that uh, the greatest potential we have out there in Africa, uh, which is in 60% of our people who are uh, youths, is uh, transforming that uh, uh, proportion of our population to people that can be productive. And the only way we can get them to become productive is by education and educating them and also trying to ensure that they are properly educated. Uh, that is why I think the key to transformation of any country uh, is developing the, the key asset we have, that is the human resource asset. Others can be wasting assets. Now, let me give you the experience we went through as a nation. Uh, when we started our uh, governance in 2007, we developed uh, a program we called the Agenda for Change that prioritized the areas of intervention, and one of them was education. But because uh, we also included mining, and we attracted foreign direct investment into the mining sector. And we were lucky at the time when we attracted the investment, the, the price of iron ore was at an all-time high. It was well above $100 per ton. But uh, within the same period, to the till end of our term, there was this massive drop we, the, the economy registered a great growth, a significant growth. We even went to the point of 20% of GDP. But when we had the twin shocks of, first it's the drop in the price of iron ore, and then later Ebola, we dropped to minus 20, from a plus 20 to minus 20. You can see the, the vast difference that it quickly tells us that uh, this, the, the mining industry could be good, but temporarily it could be a waste in Aztec. But what I think we have to develop, like other countries have done that are without even mineral resources, an example is Singapore, without no mineral resources, but because of the emphasis on the human resource development, it was able to sustain its growth. So that is why we have right. emphasized on just continuing to develop the human resource base. And with that, I think uh, that is where the future is. And that, I think, also changes the thinking of the people. Any other thought, question? Uh, did I see more hands? Yes, sir. Can you be a bit louder, please? Thank you. I don't either. <laughs> uh, but I, I think the, the, uh, the answer may lie in, in questions of style. I mean, he's, he's addressed the anger. Uh, I mean, it's true that, objectively speaking, the people who are voting, voted for him are getting absolutely nothing. I mean, there's, there's nothing being done to make this heartland of America great again. And so it, it has been uh, a bit of a hoax. Uh, there's no question about that. How that was achieved uh, is I mean, something that is for social scientists and anthropologists to determine after the fact, perhaps to some extent. But uh, certainly there, there are lots of methods 
of manipulation that have been used. Um, and then again, what I mentioned earlier, I mean, nobody addressed the grievances of the American middle class. And so he was able to latch on to that in the election cycle. Uh, and the people who voted for him are not being offered any alternative. So the opposition to Donald Trump isn't giving any alternative to the people who voted for him. And that's where we're stuck right now, I think. Thank you. Minister, would you like to add? Uh, yeah, but, but uh, it's, it is just my perception, although I'm, I'm a little bit young for having this kind of perception. I think that uh, the Trump's policy is not uh, active on international level as it used to be the US policy in the uh, past days. And uh, so uh, combining the Brexit phenomena and uh, uh, less active policy of Trump, of Trump on international level, I will say that the English-speaking world is uh, going uh, toward uh, significant political autonomy. And uh, this is just my, my, my viewpoint. And, uh, Wait, is that a good, is that a, is that a positive <coughs> development? Or do you I think, think that, yes, a that's a positive development. But uh, that should give another reason to European countries to be more unique, you know, to strengthen its political structure, especially, and uh, to be uh, moreover, uh, you know, open toward. Uh, but you know, there's one good, good uh, development. The dependence of NATO on U.S. was tremendous. Almost 60 percent of the budget was coming from U.S. Yeah. And U. and Europe, for all its independence, was so reliant mm. for its defense on the U.S. In that sense. Is it now time for Europe to get its entire policy together and now stand up on its own legs? Uh, I, I don't approve, uh, politically speaking, I do not approve the EU independence from, you know, uh, from the US. Uh, so the policies must be related to each other mm. at global level uh, because a significant share of, you know, the political power at global level is uh, uh, at the hands of the U.S. Uh, nowadays. And uh, this uh, should be respected on a continual basis. But the uh, European Union, uh, as, a as a political structure, has to consider this fact, that the English-speaking world is going toward more autonomous political system. And this is why we have Brexit. Uh, this is why we have less presence of the uh, uh, Trump's policy in, in, you know, let's say, other countries. Uh, but uh, this, this is my concept with regard to, to this issue. Sure. Yeah. Any I other think, uh, Sir, please. Uh, what, is, uh, what the world is experiencing is very worrying now, especially from um, the signals coming from America. Uh, it is not a case that it has to continue to soldier the responsibility of the world or be the international policeman. But I think now that there is a need more than ever before for the world to come together and strengthen the globalization concept, I think uh, sending signals of uh, uh, isolationist policies or uh, looking inwards and trying to promote uh, uh, national but that, policies. That's a great point, sir. I think it's also, it's also a balance. There was a time when the powerful countries were interfering in other countries matters more than they should have. Uh, and now they're looking inwards and I think interfering in their own efforts. So uh, I think the question is that what is the right balance? Where do you get I global leadership at in, the same time instead of not looking, interfere? Instead of looking inwards, I think we have to maybe uh, re-engineer uh, our areas of collaboration. Uh, yesterday there was a discussion here about uh, how do we better utilize the engagement between Europe and Africa in terms of a military intervention. We have been focusing on just fighting and fighting and fighting or maintaining peace. But where there is normalcy, what do we do to ensure that what gives rise to the war and orders are nipped right at the board? At the time of peace, that is the time we must use maybe our military to come in and support the 
normal development agendas of, of the country. countries within the sustainable development growth. This is a new approach. This is a new thinking that should be developed and uh, yeah. uh, investing the European Union, the African Union, even the Americans and the United Nations can look into it and ensure that we develop this new thinking. It will, it's a win-win situation for everybody. Any, it, other, uh, any other thought from the audience? Yes, please speak louder into the mic. Thank you. Charles and then Minister Doughty. Good point. Yeah, well, I... The question. I'll take it. You want Please to go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, think th I think that's absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of ivory towerism in, uh, in terms of uh, Western leadership. We really saw this on the migration issue in Europe. Uh, where, uh, on, the, on the migration issue, um, where there was a, a big amount of blowback uh, in terms of the non-listening. Um, and uh, I, the, the, the deficit in the U.S. in that regard, I mean, you mentioned what, what Trump is doing. He's certainly very interactive with uh, a certain base and all of that. And I think we're seeing that come back, and I think we'll see that come back in the next election cycle. So I'm somewhat optimistic on that front. And I think on in Europe, the uh, politicians have learned a lesson from uh, the uh, uh, from being so deaf on the migration issue. Right. So the question is, and, and I think what the lady was asking is, leaders in Europe are not talking to the people. Perhaps that disengagement or lack of conversation and the dialogue between the civil society and the leaders is is uh, reducing. And I think that's also an accusation about Brussels, about the European Union and the European Commission, which takes decisions without perhaps connecting with the people. Well, this, this policy has some advantages uh, to monopolize the political power within one system, but uh, for sure it has some disadvantages. You know, uh, we have to integrate every individual in the decision-making process on political basis. Uh, why they do not talk to each other, I think that uh, because EU is facing with threats uh, with uh, regard to uh, political expansion. So the, the threats that I mentioned uh, before, uh, the English-speaking world is building a new uh, political system and uh, uh, we need to applaud to that system. And uh, Europe is trying uh, to do something on its own but cannot succeed. Uh, due to, the, it, due its, to its diversity that uh, it has within the unity. unity. Uh, so what, what would be the risk uh, for the European Union and the uh, people living uh, within the European Union states? Uh, let's point out, out uh, two pillars of the globalization, multiculturalism and togetherness. Uh, I would say that multiculturalism shall never converge to togetherness. Uh, because the political autonomy of uh, each nation is uh, 
diminished, is, is vanished, and uh, that's, uh, that's a risky situation. In US, we don't have this situation because the people on cultural basis are the same, whereas in, whereas in Europe, on cultural basis, people are not the same. Uh, so, uh, di uh, uh, diversity and unity, yes, but uh, convergence of multiculturalism to togetherness, no. So this is uh, what can differentiate European values in context in, in, in relation to uh, American values. Right. One, we have time for one final question. Uh, there's a gentleman there. We'll keep it very short and brief, please. Thank you. Perhaps Charles, and then the President. Well, I wish I were running for office, but I'm in New Zealand. <laughs> uh, uh, strategies for mitigating that. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, it, it probably boils down to a new New Deal. I mean, we need a combination of uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or something like that, and somebody who can uh, articulate this, because people don't realize uh, in the, in the well, we'll go back to the Trump base, the fact that they've voted for the sort of plutocracy that you referred to uh, and that nothing is being done from and that their candidate in, in effect is, is preserving and enhancing a status quo that's against their interests. So we need a, we need a candidate who can uh, ar articulate and describe the problem in a way that people can understand it and be motivated. So, no comment on this. Do you want to add to this? The importance, I think the middle class issue is, is something which the middle class doesn't see itself connected to the larger issues. It's more inward looking. It's more it's concerned about itself uh, than anybody else. Is that a challenge that you see also? Yeah, it's a big challenge, I would say. You know, the well-developed countries are uh, capitally very intensive countries and the middle class is not on appearance the middle class uh, of the society. So uh, this has to be regarded as a concern, I would say, and uh, we should uh, give more room to the middle, middle class mm -hmm. citizens to have their role on the uh, decision-making processes with regard to political issues, whether they are sensitive or not. Thank you. One final question to all, all three of you, which uh, I would like to pose is, in this world of transition, where we used to go from a, uh, you know, a, a mm -hmm. polarity which was a, a double polarity between the Cold War countries. Uh, we then had a single uh, leader of the world, of the free world, as it were. Uh, and now I think that leadership space has been given away uh, in many ways. And I'm not saying necessarily that's a bad thing. But in this world of multipolarity, do you see multipolarity as the new normal, or do you see still out of this a new leadership emerging? And I'll, I'll start with you, Charles, and I'm going to come to Minister, and then President, I'm going to end with you because we began with you. <laughs> okay, well, the, the multipolarity seems to be the current reality, um, and it seems to be quite unstable, which is sort of defines the, um, the, the, the title of this hour. I mean, we're navigating a world in in uh, transition, although that implies that this multipolarity has to transition to something else, and we don't know exactly what that will be. Uh, and then we're also positing that we're in a time of disruption. So none of that suggests that multipolarity is a st stable state of affairs. Minister? Yes, I think that multipolarity is on a stable hand, and it should continue uh, further on. Uh, it's much better to have multipolar system rather than uh, bipolar system or 
fully concentrated system within one political structure. Uh, so in the multipolar system, you know, each, uh, uh, every society has access uh, on every, every kind of policy decision-making process. So this is the, the point that I always uh, want to You think that's, that's the way it yeah. should be? Finally, President. I, I believe we are experiencing uh, a change in phase in the world. And um, what will emerge in the end is maybe a new set of leadership within our nation states, or, or we will have a, a new world leadership that will emerge in the end. But it is too early uh, to put a finger on anything, but let us keep watching. And uh, if we don't try to influence change, the change will come and affect us. Thank you so much. And please join me in thanking the panelists for sharing their views. It's clear that uh, multipolarity is the way ahead. We are still in transition. I think some leadership would emerge, but I think that leadership itself would be a collective leadership. It will not be a leadership led by one entity or another. Thank you very much, and I think the next session will begin soon. Uh, and uh, we wish you all uh, great discussions ahead. Thank you.